Hello, this is a narrated PowerPoint from week seven of uh, grad 561, instructional design. In this PowerPoint, I'll be talking about assessment. I would like to note that the best practice for producing narrated PowerPoints is to write out the script and read from that. So the narration is smooth and well organized uh, and fluid. However, uh, due to time constraints, I have not done that. And so as a result, there will probably be some dislocations within the narration and times where there's uh, repetition and so forth. I hope this is helpful. Much of the lecture material is from our Nielsen textbook uh, in her book, her chapters on assessment. She talks about uh, classroom assessment techniques, CATS. And CATS uh, appear to be a formative assessment in that they are assessments that are focused on evaluating student learning um, during the teaching and learning process, that is prior to some summative uh, project that is used for a grade. So these assessment techniques are both are used to both uh, inform the student of where they might be with their learning as well as the instructor in terms of how the student learning is going. So there are several general characteristics of these classroom assessment techniques. They are learner-centered and teacher-directed. Like I mentioned, they are mutually beneficial and formative in nature. Um, they're very contextual. That is, they should be focused right on the topics that you're covering in class. It's an ongoing process and is just a good way to teach so that you can keep track of your own teaching and your students' learning. Nielsen proposes several uh, suggestions about when these should be used, including as lecture breaks, uh, warm-ups, and wrap-ups. And there are several suggestions as well, as listed here, starting small, providing clear directions, and giving a rationale, and then responding to the information so students see the utility in this. Um, having used these CATs or formative assessments, I will attest to the validity of these four suggestions. You don't want to really just drop these things on students. Um, it might confuse them, so being consistent in your use is, is probably a good idea. Um, and definitely using them to improve your practice and your student learning is really vital. So I think that's also a very valid uh, point. So, um, Nielsen also points out that these classroom assessment techniques should be appropriate to what you expect your students to uh, be learning. And she outlines these four categories that are tied to Bloom's levels, facts and principles, are knowledge questions, procedural skills, conditional related to when to apply certain concepts, and reflective are the higher level items on Bloom scale of analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. The main point here being that the formative assessment should be informing you about what you expect your students to be able to do. So if you want them to do a synthesis, then the formative should be related to that rather than just straight knowledge. Formative feedback is formative. Formative feedback is also part of uh, providing um, editing, uh, uh, editing and um, reviews of student papers. And uh, this is a very valid uh, um, and authentic practice, uh, although one that can be quite time consuming. And here we see five different suggestions from Nielsen about keeping to deadlines, uh, focusing on content, reasoning, and organization, being constructive and supportive, uh, giving the feedback, and also uh, this is a place that I have aired, uh, indicating to the students that um, that attending to the feedback you give them does not necessarily mean that they'll get a high grade. That this is still a uh, there's still an ongoing process. 
So formative feedback on papers is really useful for students and for yourself, but can be quite time consuming. Nielsen also talks about portfolios as a way to assess student learning. Uh, and my subtitle here is uh, Does This Way Lie Madness? I have used portfolios in some of my classes and it is a lot of work. Um, and it's a lot of work at the very end of class. Um, and so what I've done in the past is I've had students choose which samples of work they want to show and write up something about how it demonstrates certain learning outcomes and reflecting on that learning. But as a shown on the last bullet of the list, there are many issues with this, like student anxiety but not knowing their performance, uh, instructor anxiety for not knowing how your students are doing, as well as um, leaving all of the grading to the end. Uh, now these can be really beneficial from a professional point of view, but they can be a lot of work uh, in terms of the actual implementation. The next section in Nielsen book, Nielsen's book is about summative assessment. And the big takeaway message here is that a summative assessment, that is something that you give students during the term or at the end of the term to gauge their learning should be connected to learning outcomes. In other words, it makes perfect sense that if you ask students to learn something, then you should test them on what you expect them to learn. And here are some suggestions uh, from Nielsen's book um, about summative assessments. She recommends that you test early in the term and as often as possible. Uh, that you spend some time writing questions right after the lecture so that uh, this material is fresh in your mind. I think this is a really great idea, but hard to implement because usually you're kind of burnt out after teaching. Uh, good summative assessments should have great instructions where students, uh, are, it's clear what students need to be doing in order to succeed. A warm up questions are also uh, a good idea to get students in the flow of thinking about their ex uh, examination or their assessment. It's also a pretty good idea to have someone review your assessments and to proofread them, especially for multiple choice tests, because uh, there have been many times, probably more than I'd like to admit, that uh, errors are um, found on these exams by students, uh, and it can be rather um, difficult to overcome, but not impossible. And then the last thing, which is something I love doing with my multiple choice tests, is doing an item analysis so you can see which questions were particularly hard, which ones were good, and whether you have um, uh, some items of, on your test that need modification because of uh, either they are not good questions or not good answers. So it's a really valuable tool, especially for multiple choice tests. There are, of course, many ways uh, in a... Um, exam to uh, ask questions, these objective questions, including fill in the blank, true or false, matching multiple choice, multiple truth, true or false, and then the other two which are not described in detail, uh, least known and used on the list. Now, I, I think these were were actual items uh, that she indicated, but I, I didn't do any research on what these really meant. I use a lot of multiple choice questions. Uh, I actually feel like I'm pretty good at writing them. And after reading some of her examples about multiple true or false, I may actually try to start using those. I thought those were interesting as well. The other side of summative assessments are what's called subjective questions, which is kind of a misnomer and is probably better off called constructive response. Uh, and these include essays and papers um, and also things like multimedia projects and as well as graphic um, organizers or projects like, for instance, a concept map can be a good subjective or constructed uh, summative assessment. And here's a little bit more about um, written assignments. Uh, as summative assessments, some suggestions from Nielsen, um, making them very specific and providing gateways for success are ways to uh, ensure that students uh, have expectations or know what to expect um, in terms of their grading for these um, summative assessments. 
And she also recommends not having any surprises. That's be really clear and connected to outcomes about what students are doing in these constructed response. And there are some really good examples in the book where she takes questions that were very broad and open to make them more specific so that students have a, have a place to start in writing these questions. I believe there are uh, a couple of ways of looking at student performance uh, in our classes and in the sort of a, in the summative way or in summative assessment. Uh, one that I probably uh, use to a fault is that sometimes questions are just bad and that you've kind of missed the boat in terms of what students understand or what you thought they understood and the exam you have. And so that's why I have this graphic, who me? Well, sometimes exams that you write or assessments that you write really don't um, don't resonate with students and don't resonate with the way you've taught. So um, this does happen and I think it's valuable as instructors that we look at this potential or this side of, of student performance. The next section in Nielsen's about um, working with students to prepare them for assessment and this will be uh, a question that you will get what will be on the test and so this t-shirt will serve as as a focal point for this part of the PowerPoint. There are many ways that you can help students perform better on your assessments um, by such things as helping them with study strategies, having review sheets, um, providing sample exams so that they can see the types of problems. A test blueprint is a, an outline of the types of questions you're going to ask and the percentage um, from each section that you've taught. So these are useful because then students will know where to concentrate their efforts on what you think is important. Review sessions are difficult, um, but there are good ways to run them that are useful. And also in, within your exams to make sure that students know what they're, they need to do. So if you want them to synthesize, you should give them examples or specific directions about what you mean by that term. Um, or if you ask them to describe, uh, you need to make specific indicators as to what that means for their responses. Student anxiety is a big thing with assessments. I know it was for me. Uh, and here are some items that might help uh, to decrease anxiety. Having reviews is one of them, providing study guidance, uh, reassuring students that they can perform well. Um, oversight refers to, and I do this, the tendency for instructors to walk around in the classroom and to be kind of hovering, and that can create anxiety. Minimizing interruptions is a good idea so it doesn't disturb the flow of students. Sticking to schedules of when you're going to have exams and have clear policies um, about exams. Uh, consider dropping the lowest grade so that that poor performance does not have such a huge uh, impact. Uh, having frequent exams, which is kind of hard in a 10 week term making sure they have enough time to finish exams and to using relaxation techniques with your students so that they will uh, in fact um, relax during the exam. I'm going to run through this real quickly. This is an article from the New York Times about studies that have shown the importance and impact of providing pretests uh, for students in terms of their learning and they call it, there's a couple terms that were interesting in the article, falling forward, that testing actually can be a way of enriching and altering memory, and that testing can also, or pre-testing, can help with this uh, fluency illusion where students think they know the material better than they really do. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Now, this fluency illusion has been known for a long time, back in 1620. Um, Francis Bacon indicated that it's okay to read through things, but you also have to recite them in order to learn them efficiently. So let's take a look at the some broad results or broad coverage of this article. Um, so studies have shown that uh, the most effective way to, uh, to learn some material is through a combination of memorizing and reciting. And um, this was a study, I think, of elementary school kids where they found that the balance between one-third memorizing and two-thirds reciting was the good place to be in terms of performance. Uh, there's also 
a thing called a testing effect so that the closer you deploy a test to the assignment, the better you'll have students performing. And then I believe the rest of the stuff is all related to studies that show the potential importance and impact of pre-testing students. And what they found is that this pre-testing um, can help facilitate learning, that pre-test before lectures do improve performance on finals, and it's partly because students learn how to focus on how to think about the material um, prior to hearing a lecture or doing an activity and that these pretests help expose this fluency illusion where people think they know more than they actually do. Um, so even if it's really broad guessing, apparently the, the hypothesis is that this primes the brain for possibilities and better retrieval so that students um, are able to learn better and then perform better. Now scaffolding, cognitive scaffolding is important, so they have to know something about the topic already so they can build on that, and so the statement was made that that without this scaffolding, like for instance studying a foreign language like Chinese, it might not be so effective to have this um, pretest. Um, so tests serve as introductions to what students should learn, and the students realize this is not a final judgment on what they did not know, um, and so it helps them learn what they should know. So I encourage you to have a look at this article. It's very interesting and it's a good read. The next section is on grading. What does a C mean? And the right list on the right shows a um, words taken out of Nielsen, exceptional, good, fair, no understanding, below level of chance. So that's our A through F uh, grading sequence. Now, if you talk about grading, it's hard to escape uh, the topic of grade inflation. And here's a gentleman, Stuart, uh, who is a geophysicist turned author and turned investigator of grade inflation. The graph on the right shows some pretty clear trends uh, over 1991 to 2007, with some years missing there. The grades have inflated for all schools as well as when you break them out. Um, Another graph which is trotted out there is this that shows the percentage of letter grades and it's pretty clear A's are going up, C's are going down, and the rest are staying pretty stable. So uh, certainly there's talk about this at K-12 and there's a lot of talk about this at universities and uh, it really causes some people to uh, get in an uproar. But like anything, there's no black and white and so if you look around, this is an old article you will find that people uh, think this is a myth and that maybe one of the possibilities is that students are just doing better. Uh, maybe the assessments are more authentic uh, and that teachers at universities are doing better and so they're getting better grades. So um, you can uh, argue uh, kind of either way on this. Okay, so let's move on to types of grading. Um, I've listed three here. Norm reference, which is based on curves. Uh, criterion reference, which is based on things like rubrics. And then the last one, which is called outcome-based or outcomes-based or standards-based grading is an interesting technique where you develop specific standards of learning or outcomes you want students to reach and then you provide them opportunities to reach proficiency. Uh, and then um, when they get to have the proficiency, then you provide a grade. I've used some of this. I found it very hard in the class I used it in, um, but you can find research on this um, probably through most, most disciplines. So it's an interesting way to look at student uh, grading. So good qualities of grading, pretty consistent here, accurate, consistent, and valuable. Um, so it's no big secret that this is what you want to do with your your assessments. Um, it's clear, but not always easy to do, uh, especially for uh, large classes. The next section, uh, Nielsen covers some ways to uh, grade constructive responses, and they're separated into kind of two categories, the atomistic, uh, where you come up with an idea of what the ideal essay looks like and then you track this idea as you read through and you can see here there's a list of difficulties associated with this uh, type of uh, grading um, but it's something that I've used for sure and it, it works out alright 
And then on the right side, they show inductive holistic, where you read all the papers and then rank and comment on them. Uh, deductive holistic, where you use a rubric, a rubric um, where you have clear descriptions of what you want students to be able to uh, tell you in their writing or their constructive response. And then analytical is kind of combination where you use all the criteria and then you average each one to uh, get a final grade. So that concludes um, this 20 minute lecture on the chapter from Nielsen on assessment. I hope it's useful and understandable and uh, something that you'll listen to. Thank you.